Now, I'm not sure my mother would approve of these next two guys. Uh, two young medical doctors, graduates no less, uh, in practice with promising careers and the possibility of real, stable, useful lives, uh, throw their energy and their money into a company devoted to electronic entertainment. And we're not talking about something solid like television. <laughs> But computer and console video games, no less. Yikes, what were these guys thinking? What was on their minds? Everybody knows that the field is uh, murderously competitive and the attention span of the primary market, am I right, which is sort of teenage boys, is notoriously short. Uh, nonetheless, just to give you a sense of it all, uh, it is at this point uh, north of a $9 billion business, which means that electronic games now exceed the motion picture industry on a worldwide basis. And uh, the growth appears to be poised to continue at an exponential level. Uh, their company is called BioWare, and it has scored the coup of coups. Uh, they have partnered with George Lucas and Lucasfilm in creating the uh, first Star Wars role-playing game. I'm uh, not only an ex-Montrealer, but I'm also a cardiac Edmontonian in my heart. Um, <laughs> and these are Lanzmann from Alberta, and their names are Greg Zestruk and Ray Muzika, who I like to think of as Ray Much Muzika. <laughs> So uh, I'll get us started here um, while Greg warms up the laptop. We, uh, we were really struggling when we were asked to, uh, to come here. This is a great honor, by the way, Moses, um, well, and what we would want to talk about. Because it's, uh, I think when you do something for a number of years, you, you stop thinking that other people are going to find it interesting. But uh, ultimately, what we turned back to was what we do, which is uh, basically it's about interactivity. It's about connecting people and enabling them and entertaining them. And that's what, uh, we have two companies actually. One's Bioware, which makes video games, and uh, the other is called Code Baby, and that's a newer company, just a couple years old, that we formed with um, a third partner a couple years ago. And we're gonna talk a bit about both of those, and the way we're gonna tie it together, we finally figured out how to link these when we, uh, when we're desperate for, for a topic, we, we started looking at old uh, videos of, of Idea City from past years. And the, uh, <laughs> So watching old Idea City uh, videos from, from last year, uh, Don Tapscott was talking about the internet and, and dot coms and how, how perspective has changed over the last few years and how he felt that the internet was far from dead, although the dot com era certainly was dead in, in many ways, but not because of uh, a failure of the inter but internet, but rather because of a failure of the people doing the companies that were on the internet to, to really focus on what, what was the differentiation of the internet, what, it was, what was the really uh, powerful thing about the internet? And we think that's the people, that's the, that's the number of people that, that are actually on the internet. And so where we're starting with in this talk is actually just to describe where, it's, where the industry is going. As you can see, this is a, a projection, this is actually obtained from the CIA. It's amazing what you can find on the internet if you look hard enough. Um, it's not easy to find, which is one of the things that we're trying to do with Code Babies, to make it more powerful and easy to find information. But uh, you know, we were at about 350 million people on the internet worldwide in the last year, about 450 million people in 2002, and we're heading for upwards of a billion people in, by 2010. And that's pretty impressive when you think about it. A billion minds all linked together through this global network of computers. And right now, they're not really linked in, in a way that's really meaningful. They're not really sharing information and collaborating as much as we think they can be. And that's kind of what our talk is about. How can we do that? How can we get people to interact and actually enable them and in the process empower them? So one thing we'll be doing is tagging off. Ray and I uh, kind of alternate and finish each other's sentences and people in the video game business kind of call us the hive mind because we're never, the two of us together make one normal person I think in their <laughs> perspectives. Uh, so what you're probably wondering right now is how did we get up on this stage? You know, why are we here? Well, as, as Moses mentioned, we're medical doctors by training. We worked around Alberta for about five years in small towns and in the city. Um, toward the end of medical school, we started making medical education software. We, our passion was software and making things. And we started making medical education software, but then we had this opportunity to make video games, electronic entertainment. We said, you know, 
education, medical stuff, forget it. Video games was our love. When we were kids, we, we both wax philosophical about the stories of playing games from 10, 11 years old into the wee hours, and it's, it's really what, what drives us. And what's happened that's really interesting with Bioware and with Codebaby is that we didn't really have a, a plan. You know, we just kind of started going and stuff started happening. We kind of went a certain direction. Bioware's now at about 130 people. We've been, not only with the Star Wars game, which is a great honor, but we've been blessed with all kinds of business awards. Like, it was the fastest growing company in Alberta last year, 11th fastest in Canada, according to Profit Magazine last year as well. And, you know, here we are today, 130 people, brilliant. You know, we, we sort of worry about the strategy of the company and the direction, but ultimately we serve the people. We get people applying from all over the world, and our job is to let them do their work. Let them create, think, let them sort of conceive of what can be done in the future. And that's essentially what, what we want to talk a little bit about is one of our next games, and also show you a little bit about our next company, which we think probably takes this idea of collaboration of, of the minds of millions of people and puts it into more of a clear perspective. So um, our talk really isn't about Star Wars, unfortunately, but we knew we, uh, we had to throw something in about Star Wars in order to uh, fulfill, the, fulfill the bio that uh, is written up uh, in, our, in the uh, concourse, or the proceedings, rather. We start the movies, uh, so we, we actually got a little video down. from uh, one of our games here. Down. If we can get the lights down, then we can, uh, yeah. we can play that for you. So we can get the lights turned back on. What, uh, what we're going to do now is actually show you an example from Bioware and an example from Codebaby of how we believe this, this future can be brought about of interactivity and of empowerment for all the users on the internet, and getting these billion minds of, in 10 years actually working together, collaborating. So the example we have from Bioware is uh, in a game that we put out recently called Neverwinter Nights. And uh, it's actually the first game of its type to there have been other games that have done similar things, but this is the first one to really, really do it in a, in, a, in a big way, to release tools to our fans with the game that allow them to make content, make their own content, make anything that we provide for the storyline of the game, absolutely everything, they can make their own examples of it. So we're, we call this the Aurora tool set, uh, the Bioware Neverwinter Aurora tool set. That's what Greg has open right now, and he'll just describe a bit of this uh, as he's going through it in terms of what he's doing. And I'm so, going to log into the session after we play, after we create the module. So what the tool set does is allows users to basically create their favorite pen and paper Dungeons and Dragons sessions. And there may be some D&D players in the audience here, but what this does is allows us as creators to let our fans create. What makes that powerful is having, the imagine, imagine the possibility of thousands and thousands of people, people creating modules. What I'm doing here, you can see I've got a little preset area, I've got these little leaves that are falling. And, one thing you don't have to worry about when you're using this tool set is that the art is taken care of for you by our artists. I'm going to make a, see a little stream here. I'm going to sort of lengthen it a little bit. It's sort of in real time, kind of changes the environment. And I go, geez, I want to make a big pit. And so I'll make a big pit here and kind of build it out. And wow, that's kind of cool. It, it decides, OK, there should be a waterfall here. It builds a waterfall for you. So this, this, this is what the tool set does, is lets people just make whatever they want. I'm going to do this really quickly. We'll lay down one other thing. There's sort of presets and big chunks I can drop down. I'm going to drop a little grove down here. We can get the lights turned down a little bit as well so we can see this better. Yeah, so I drew, drop down a little grove, and I want to make some kind of spooky lighting in there. So let's make some, get some visual effects. Some magic sparks sound good. So 
You know, when I zoom in there, you can see now there's some, you know, there's gonna be something really interesting there. Just, how about a shaft of light, orangic sparks. So this wouldn't be fun unless there are monsters there. So what we're gonna do is, uh, well, in our minds, it's not fun unless there's <laughs> monsters. <laughs> uh, uh, so grab, uh, grab some, what we have, uh, the one thing, the cool, another cool thing the game does, it takes care of all the details. You can pick an encounter group. You sort of take something, you know, let's find some, uh, some nice, uh, nice creatures here. How about a demon group? So what this does is this decides that when Ray walks into this area, these demons are going to pop out and attack him. And then it checks how many people are in the game. This is a multiplayer game. Up to 64 people can play at the same time. It sees how many people are playing. It says, ah, oh, you need 20 demons. You have 20 people. So plop that down there. So when Ray walks in here, he's going to see, see this thing happen. So I'm going to save it out now. And then what I'm going to do is log into the session that he just created. We're, we're linked through a, a simulated LAN with a twist Ethernet cable, so just through the back of the laptop. So it's a effectively a similar experience to what someone would see on the Internet. Um, as Greg mentioned, you can play this game single player as well. We actually provide a, a storyline that's over 100 hours um, and allow people to play, play through that single player if they want. They can play through that collaboratively in a multiplayer fashion, or they can uh, generate their own content using these tools and then share them on the Internet. And we'll show you uh, how, we're, how we're actually propagating this content as well for our fans. What Greg's doing right now is just loading up uh, the module. Now, role-playing games, we refer to that term, and, and we haven't really defined it yet what it is. But uh, the, uh, a role-playing game is basically one where you, you play the role of a character, and you advance a storyline, and you're, you're sort of the hero in this epic quest that uh, you take your character through. And uh, it's really about character development and story development. There's a lot of words in these games. In, uh, in Baldur's Gate, one of our most successful series, um, we had over a million words of dialogue, for example. And that was, that was actually shipped all over the world. We sold about four million copies of that, that series, all told. So a lot of people have played that and, and, and read, read the stories. So we're putting a, I actually happen to be identical to Ray, so I'll put a torch up. You can see all like the shadows play off the environment. So you can see also video games are at a level where the detail and the realism is getting kind of scary. I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, you can actually even have multiple shadows in the environment. So Ray's gonna, actually I'm gonna change the video option so I can have my multiple shadows. There we go. So what I'm gonna do is uh, buff my character up, summon in some creatures and, and uh, some companions to help me out in this adventure. So I just summon in a uh, huge water elemental to help me. And I can have a familiar as well in my party that is a, a friend and companion. This is my, my dog. Uh, it's actually a hellhound it's called. I'm gonna cast a few spells on myself now to allow me to prepare for the battle coming up. Mainly because if I don't do this, uh, I probably won't survive long enough to be able to get off any really interesting spells for you. So people that play Dungeons and Dragons know what we're doing. If not, it's sort of just <laughs> fancy, fancy lights and a good, stuff like that. A good analogy for this is, uh, you know, Star Wars, that's a common one. That's, that's a science fantasy. Uh, Another one, of course, is uh, Lord of the Rings. It's, uh, it's similar to J.R.R. Tolkien's work in terms of what, what the idea behind Dungeons and Dragons is about, which is uh, what this game is set in. So now I've, I've actually cast a few spells on myself. I'm gonna wander over to that grove that Greg just created. So we're actually playing in the module. He created it on that machine. It's now being propagated to this machine the same way that it can be propagated on the internet. So I'm now walking up to the grove here. Okay. I guess I'm entering it from this side. I'll walk inside, and I'm going to back out so that uh, I can actually get a few spells off. So it spawned in a few creatures that uh, Greg set up. That's that encounter group. You can see a huge demon creature with uh, flame wings on the back there. I'm going to cast a spell called Meteor Storm. It drops meteors from the sky. I'm going to summon my own demon in here to help me out by casting a, a gate spell. So now we have a couple on the, on the screen there. Now he's helping me out. I'm going to cast another spell called Weird, and this spell is interesting. It actually summons your worst nightmare in and makes all your enemies die from sheer fright. So it doesn't look like they really got that scared by that. But being demons and all, I guess, they're yeah. kind of used to that sort of thing. So now we're going to get beaten up really badly as they sort of pile out here. 
So this is, you know, really we can go on and on and play this all day, but we probably should get back to the presentation. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to shut uh, this down, start the presentation back up, and you know, show you what we think is the most interesting part of this game, which actually isn't the game. And um, we're going to show you a little bit about what we've done, built, we built around the game to harness the fans. And, and to put it in perspective, um, some of the games we've made, the Baldur's Gate series, for example, um, has sold about four million copies worldwide through a number of sequels. Neverwinter Nights just shipped actually on Tuesday, so it's been kind of scary for us here because we've been kind of watching the reviews online as we've been uh, uh, here at the, you know at those Macs over there. We kind of get on and check how many people are playing. What we've built around the game is we've created a place where players come to see what's going on, a nexus, a community site where people see you know, what, what, what's going on in the game, for example. Over here, it's hard to read, but there's actually 50,000 people signed up on our boards. Um, this was actually 30,000 on Monday, so 20,000 people have signed up since the game came out. Last night, there were about 3,300 people playing online at one time. You can also play it single players. It's got a, a very small, we always make really big games, 100-hour campaign you can play by yourself offline before you go online. And what the community site does is where all fans trade information. They say, I want to build this module. Do you want to come play with me? It's going to say that there's places where people can trade their modules and s share information, send it back and forth. So really, the power of, of the game isn't just the game. It's this. And it's, it's what takes the entire world of players and lets them play with each other, therefore bringing more and more in until it becomes this incredible critical mass. And that's what's exciting about the game is we've got a, a group of people that are really interested in, in continuing it forever in, in many ways. You can serve your own servers, all kinds of stuff. So then the next topic we want to talk about a bit is uh, the, our, our other company called Codebaby. And uh, this isn't a video game company, but it's using concepts that we've developed in video games and trying to apply them to functionality on the internet. And again, our goal here is to try and empower users to engage them through entertainment initially and actually make it easier for them to find things on the internet. And <coughs> the uh, next slide shows, uh, this is a prototype uh, just early drawing. We're still in development. Uh, we have other, other art we can show from, from this, but we wanted to make this kind of short. So the basic idea behind Codebaby is you have a character. It's your agent, your internet agent, your avatar that you interact with. It's, uh, it, it tells you jokes. It uh, has a personality that develops over time. You become, uh, you do learn, learn what it's like and you actually interact with it. And, and basically it comes to know what your likes are and what, what, what kind of things it can do for you. It links useful functionality to you. And it does this by really taking the power of those billion people in 2010 and trying to find others who are like-minded with you through a process that's called collaborative filtering or data mining. And Greg will describe that a little bit in the next slide. So the next, next thing that, that to talk about with Codebaby is it's a generic interface using game technology that appears everywhere. You know, it, I, I think we started getting kind of scared when we uh, saw in your, you know, uh, catalog fridges with internet connections. You know, as soon as that happens, you know, something's strange. So the concept of actually the internet being everywhere is upon us. Um, and Codebaby is a way that we've conceived that we think people will be able to use it on any device, you know, phone, PDA, your fridge, uh, in your car, all kinds of ways. And the collaborative filtering is really cool because what it is is it creates what we call tribes. And tribes are people that have similar interests. You know, we all come, Ray and I remember the same tribe. Maybe it's the video game tribe or the, you know, Star Wars D&D fan tribe. But we have similar interests. If, if, if you can take all those people in the world and, and com combine them into groups and find what, what we all share, it actually uses the power of the numbers to actually make my personal experience better on the internet, playing a game, whatever the source. And this is a, you know, after, I guess we've been doing this eight years now and it's been a really interesting trip. We, we always talk about the great people we work with and, and, you know, they come from a variety of backgrounds. This is kind of saying something I should have said earlier, but really we're a function of the people we work with. We just serve them, we let them do their jobs, we, they think of these great ideas and we sort of help them, help them make it happen. And really that's getting towards the end. I think we're, we're looking okay here. Yeah. at the end. Yeah, so to wrap up now, just to summarize what Greg said again, um, I can't, like Greg, I can't emphasize enough how great the people we work with are. We have 130 plus people at Bioware and um, over, over 10 now at Codebaby and they're, without exception, some of the, the smartest, most creative people I've ever met and that's, that's why we're doing what we're doing is it's just such a pleasure. And, and it's not because we don't like medicine, I think it's because we actually like this more. Like we're really, <laughs> really excited about this, and it's it's really something we can be passionate about. 
Um, so it's a real, real honor to, to work with all of them. What, to go back to this, um, I guess with, with BioWare, we're trying to build interactive experiences that allow people to collaborate. And with CodeBaby, we're trying to empower people with functionality on the internet by building a next generation interface, what we hope will become the dominant interface to the internet eventually, if it, if it works. So um, to go back to this slide now, it's no longer numbers, hopefully. Hopefully now it's, it's actually, each of, these, each of these numbers on this table actually is a person. Somewhere out there is a mind. Someone, someone is actually on the internet, and they have ideas, and they have visions and dreams. And wouldn't it be powerful if you could actually link to other people who have the same dreams that you do, or who can actually take the dream that you have and actually say, yeah, that's pretty cool. Why, why don't we work together on that? Now, we were going to end there, but I think we wanted to add one comment based on something that uh, someone said during one of the session breaks yesterday that, that really made me think. And he, he pointed out, yeah, that's very cool that there's going to be a billion people on the internet in 2010, but aren't there like going to be five, six, seven billion people on the planet at that point? What about them? What, what are they doing? Why aren't they enabled? Why aren't they empowered? So the question that we can't really deal with, but that maybe all of us together can, is how do we actually get those people in, into this interaction and collaboration? Because then I think we've got something that's really powerful and maybe something that actually would bring people together for the first time. So that's pretty much our talk.